the privilege to start a new series of the Gospel of Mark. Um, my intent is that this be really a sub-series, uh, part of an overarching series where we're going to preach through all of the Gospels over the next couple of years. Um, now, we're not going to do them back to back to back. There'll be other series in between there, but you're, we're going to come back to this as we walk through each of the Gospels. And so we're going to begin uh, with the book of Mark. Um, and truth, truthfully, my, my reasoning is, is that um, I, I desire that we really know the Savior that we claim to follow. And um, there are many ideas about Jesus. Most people, if you ask them, have a favorable opinion of Jesus. Um, I mean, who doesn't like him? For the most part, that's, that's kind of how it goes. Uh, they see him as different things. Um, they have a, a favorable opinion of the historical Jesus but not as many know him as he is, as Lord, as Savior. So what better way to get to know him than through the Gospels written by those closest to him and their close associates? Now, you may also be wondering why I'm messing with the the natural given order of the Gospels and beginning with the Gospel of Mark um, instead of Matthew, because some of you are thinking it's, it's already there in order. It goes Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, right? So did you forget about Matthew? I I didn't. it's not that I can't figure out um, or that I'm just, you know, criminally unfamiliar with the Holy Bible. It's intentional. Most scholars believe that Mark's gospel was the first one written. And so we're going to begin with it. Also, Mark's is, it's different than the others. It's, it's really, it's, it's, it's pretty amazing that God would give us four different gospels. Um, and each of them presents a different angle on Jesus. Uh, They have a different purpose in their writing, and this is, I think part of it is how each of these men, uh, kind of their their personality, the way they were wired, the way they thought and acted, but also, obviously, the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And so you may say, well, I've read them, and there seem to be kind of some redundancies. Some of these stories seem really familiar, but there's some details that are a little bit different, and there are um, a lot of overlaps, but there really is unique purpose in each of the Gospels. And so that's, again, that's another reason why I want to come back to each of them um, and kind of show these different facets um, as different sub-series as we work through each of the Gospels. So, you know, each author under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit shows us that different angle. And I think part of that is because Jesus wasn't one-dimensional. Um, and you aren't either. Like, w- people aren't. That's the way personalities work. That's the way that we're created is that you're not a one-dimensional person. You're not defined by one uh, character trait or one uh, physical trait or even one belief, um, one habit, one skill. That's not what defines you. We're all, we're multidimensional. We're multifaceted. And Jesus was as well. Even in his coming, he had different purposes in them. He carried unique purposes that were for all the people. Um, Let's not forget the proclamation of the angels found in Luke chapter 2. They said, don't be afraid for look, I proclaim to you good news of great joy. This is Christmas, right? But it says this, that will be for all the people. The good news that Jesus brought was for all the people. You can say that also like this, all different kinds of people. And so Jesus wasn't one-dimensional. It's, it's, it's actually kind of a, a character trait that Paul, the apostle, tried to take on himself. He said, I try to become all things to all men that by any means I might reach some. So he, he didn't try to just lock himself in. I'm just going to do this one thing this one way. And so that's, each of the authors brings a different approach. Now, if you know anything about Mark or John Mark, you might think that he would be an unexpected one to write the first account of the life of Jesus Christ. He grew up in Jerusalem. He came to know the original apostles, including Peter. Then around AD 46, he was invited on a missionary trip with his cousin Barnabas and a guy named Paul, who we just mentioned, the apostle. And not far into the expedition, he abandoned the mission. He bailed on Barnabas and Paul and went home. Um, Often people think that it's probably when things started to get difficult. A young John Mark said, this isn't exactly what I thought I was signing up for. And he went back home. So when it came time for their second missionary journey, uh, Barnabas says, hey, let's take John Mark again. And Paul says, we're not not taking the quitter. 
He bailed on us last time. Why would we take him again? I identify greatly with Paul, my natural instinct, and maybe you're like that as well. You're like, listen, we already went through that with this guy. And so, and actually, what, co- what happened then is, is Paul and Barnabas, they get kind of a heated disagreement about this. Barnabas really wanted to take him with him. And if you know anything about Barnabas, his very name means son of encouragement. This is who he was. He wanted to bring the young guy, give him a second chance, continue to encourage and invest in him. And Paul was more focused on, no, we've got to keep going. We don't. And so he was pressing the gospel out. And so they actually split up. Barnabas takes young John Mark, and Paul gets a new partner named Silas. And they go on into their journeys. And so what we know, though, is that Barnabas's investment in the life of this young John Mark um, helped to develop him into a strong disciple of the Lord Jesus, who even later Paul himself identified as a fellow laborer in the books of Colossians and Philemon and 2 Timothy. So at some point along the way, um, the Apostle Paul and John Mark were kind of reunited and worked together. So the Gospel of Mark, it's different than the other Gospels. He had a clear purpose. He didn't set out to present a traditional biography of Jesus. He wasn't overly worried with keeping things in a chronological order. He wasn't worried about sharing every little detail of every story. He actually never knew or personally followed Jesus, but he became a close and most trusted associate of Peter. And as Peter's death drew near, there seems to be an urgency in John Mark's life that he wanted to write down all of the things that his mentor Peter had taught him. He wanted to write down the good news, the gospel, the story of Jesus Christ. And he also wanted to encourage the church who were facing intense persecution. Um, Peter was executed down the, around the time of... Um, the persecution that came under the Roman emperor Nero, and when we know all the things that happened under Nero's watch. So his writing is fast-paced, it's focused, and it kind of jumps around. So with that in mind, um, as we walk through this gospel, um, we're going to do selected messages to help us grab the major themes from the gospel of Mark. But as we do that, let me encourage you to add this to your daily reading. Read through the Gospel of Mark. It's again, it's pretty fast paced. He kind of jumps, he gets right to the point. And uh, don't rush through it, read and meditate and marinate. So, Mark doesn't begin like some of the other Gospels. He doesn't give a story of the birth of Jesus. He has a different purpose in mind. He wants to show us Jesus as the Son of Man, as the servant of man. So, he gets right into that. He gets right into uh, John the Baptist, and he's proclaiming the coming of the Messiah. Then we see Jesus' baptism, after his baptism, we hear the Father speak from the heavens. This is my Son in who I am well pleased. You may be familiar with that story. And then immediately we see Jesus taken out into the wilderness where he is tempted for 40 days. And then Jesus returns after John is arrested. And that's where we're going to pick up today in Mark chapter 1, verse 14. It says this, after John was arrested, Jesus went to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near, Jesus said. Repent and believe the good news. So Jesus goes into Galilee proclaiming good news. Uh, But he wasn't just making an announcement. He was calling for a response from people. He was calling them to respond to something greater than anything they had ever heard before. Because he didn't just come to proclaim a new religion but the coming of the kingdom of God. Now, the culture that those would have, that who heard this would have lived in was uh, they were under Roman rule. They longed for the coming of this prophesied Messiah, but even their religious leaders had completely lost sight of God's purposes for them. Honestly, the, the religious leaders, we, we, you would know them as the Pharisees, if you're familiar at all with the New Testament. They had really kind of become um, kind of spiritual... Um, profiteers, maybe is the best way to put it. They had positions of power. They were able to gain wealth and prominence and authority because of that. 
They established all these rules and laws and regulations and basically lived to enforce those with uh, great strictness, but they did not point anyone to the one true God. They were more about self-righteousness and all the things that we could do to save ourselves. So when Jesus comes and proclaims this good news, he comes and says, the kingdom of God has come near. Now, we have this unique thing when we read this because we know that we know something that the original hearers didn't know. We know that when Jesus proclaimed the coming of the kingdom of God, he wasn't just proclaiming that uh, the new church was going to be formed and there was going to be all this. He was also proclaiming that he himself, Jesus would often talk about the kingdom of God coming as that new church that we were going to see empowered in, on the day of Pentecost, but also he himself, he had come near. And he calls them. He calls for a response this double imperative to repent and believe. And it sounds like two actions, but it's really one. The decision to, to turn and follow Jesus is always a decision to turn away from your old ways, from following your own leading. What he was calling them to was the opposite of what their religious leaders were calling them to. Their religious leaders were saying, here's all the rules, keep all the rules, and then you will be right with God. And the next time you break the rules, and you're going to break the rules, you're going to come back, you're going to make another sacrifice, you're going to do everything you can to keep yourself righteous, keep yourself holy. They were all about all of those things and all the ceremonies, but they had missed the heart of God. So when Jesus calls them to repent and to believe, it's not two actions, it's one. The idea that you could believe in Jesus and not turn from your sin is something that Jesus never taught. But it's something that we kind of have a tendency to live by. We tend to think that we can believe in Jesus without truly turning from our sinful ways. Uh, this is the idea that Jesus um, would be my Savior, but not my Lord. Or in other words, he would save me from, from going to hell, but he's not actually going to be the boss of my life. I'm not actually going to follow him. I just want him to take me to heaven. I just want him to remove the penalty. Um, you, you, some people would call it like easy believism. Oh, yeah, I believe in Jesus. Yeah, sure, I've placed my faith in him. But they, they haven't repented. So there are many who claim to have believed without repenting. And Jesus always brought the two together, repent and believe. Repent and believe. The idea that you could do this and not turn from your sinful way, Jesus never taught that. So Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming this. He came proclaiming that the time is fulfilled. Hey, guys, what you've been waiting for, what you've been longing for, the Messiah, the Rescuer, the Savior, it's come near. It's time to repent and believe. He called for a response. He keeps going in verse 16. As he passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, Simon's brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Follow me, Jesus told them, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat putting their nets in order. And immediately he called to them. And they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. This section, verses 14 through 20, Jesus proclaims and he calls. To the people he proclaimed and he called for a response, repent and believe to Simon and Andrew, to James and his brother John, he calls them to follow him. And they drop everything. They leave businesses, they leave their family, and they follow him. Their response is immediate. No hesitation. And you may be thinking, if you picked up in the Gospel of Mark and you hadn't read any of the other Gospels, you might think, wow, why would they follow this guy? I mean, would they have followed anyone who came by as like, hey, stop, stop that job, come follow me? Sure. Were they just looking, waiting for somebody? Well, it's, it's, not, it's not blind faith. It may appear that way, but it's not. Again, keep in mind that Mark, it, it, he's okay with skipping over details because he wants to get to the heart of it, okay? So we know from John 1 that Jesus had already met Peter Andrew and several other future disciples who had heard his teaching, who had already seen some of his ministry before he comes to Galilee. Mark skips all that. He goes straight to the point. 
No history lesson, no dramatic story. He doesn't tell anything about, you guys remember in some of the other gospels where when Jesus encounters them and they're out fishing and he says, hey, cast the net on the other side and they haul in this great haul of fish. Some of you may have read that story before. Mark doesn't tell any of that. He gets straight to the point. What is the point? Jesus proclaims and he calls for response. And they respond immediately. No hesitation. This is a pivotal moment in the life of four men and really in the history of the church as we know it. And it's stripped down to this. Jesus called, they followed. No hesitation. They had heard enough, they had seen enough to respond to Jesus with an immediate yes. An immediate yes. No hesitation. They had seen who he is and they responded. Jesus came proclaiming and calling for response. So much like Mark, today I want to get straight to the point. From this, I have three lessons and three questions. Here's the first lesson. Following Jesus requires leaving your nets. These men had heard Jesus teaching. They had seen enough of his ministry, so when he called, they dropped, they dropped their nets. For them, it was literal. As far as I know, for all of us, it would be figurative nets. No professional fishermen in the room that I know of. Following Jesus always requires you to drop your nets. Here's what that looks like. If you truly follow Jesus, you're going to become passionate about things that could make your nets seem pointless, seem aimless. And in following him, he, he gives new, eternal purpose to your days, to your family, to your job, to your existence. For these first men, it was these first disciples it meant literally leaving their jobs behind, dropping their nets, and following Jesus. But as you continue to follow the story of Jesus through the Gospels, what do you see? What do you see as people turn and repent and believe in Jesus? We see people, people repent, become followers of Jesus, and then we see Jesus do what? Send them back to their homes back to their towns, back to their jobs as followers of him. Now, it very well may be that the call that God puts on your life is going to require you to drop your nets, to, to leave behind a current occupation to take on a new one. But for most, and all those really who would, after these original disciples, who would repent and believe in Jesus, it meant that they were still following him, they were still working their jobs, but they were doing it with a new passion and a new purpose. What that means is, is that you no longer live for the purpose of this temporary existence that you have. You understand that you have an eternal purpose within the nets. You no longer just value what this world can bring you, you now have an eternal purpose. Following Jesus always requires you to, to drop your nets. It requires you to put those at his feet. It requires you to, to follow him. Here's a second lesson. Jesus never shares more than we can bear. He said, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of people. I'll make you fish for people, fishers of men. He doesn't share anything else. He doesn't say, Hey, Simon, follow me. I'll make you fishers of people. And one day, you're going to be executed for it. And you may be thinking, Jesus, is this like a bait and switch here? Why are you withholding, Jesus? Why don't you give full disclosure? Full disclosure that, hey, when you follow me, it's not all going to be great. Later, he would tell, there were people who would come and say, hey, we want to be one of your followers. And Jesus would say, well, you do know that I don't have a home. I don't have a bed. I don't have a place to lay my head. I don't actually have anything in this world. And they're like, oh, oh, okay, no, never mind. That's, 
I'll follow you from over here, you know. I got your back, Jesus, like way back. He, it's not full disclosure. He, he never shares more than we can bear. He gives us enough, though, to make the right decision. And following him is always the right decision because he knows what is best for us. The same is it's true for us. We don't know what the future holds. These, these four men, they didn't know. But they immediately said yes and followed him. We don't know exactly how difficult it will be to follow Jesus, but we do know enough to know that it's worth it. Actually, we have a benefit that these first disciples didn't have. We have all of Scripture. We have the teachings of Christ where he would say, hey, in this world you will have trouble. But don't lose heart, I've overcome the world. We, we see later the teachings of Scripture where Jesus says, oh, if you follow me, they're going to hate you and persecute you. It's going to happen. So, so we have all that where they didn't, but what we don't have, so we don't know how it all plays out. We don't know what's next. We don't know what everything is going to look like in the days ahead. He says, follow me, and I will make you fish for people. You see, it's our job to follow, and it's his job to make us into whatever he wants for us. Which leads us to the last of the three lessons. Because Jesus sees potential that you cannot. Before Jesus called Simon, named, called him Simon Peter, everyone saw Simon the fisherman. Honestly, it's probably all he saw in himself. These men probably didn't have a whole lot of dreams and aspirations beyond their current situation. But Jesus calls Simon and he sees 3,000 being saved after one sermon. Simon didn't see that. No one saw that coming. He sees a, a man who would follow Jesus and lead faithfully. He sees a man who would stumble, who would blow it in royal fashion, actually denying that he even knew Jesus. But then he sees a man who, once he is restored, leads and shares the gospel with power. He sees a man who rises again and remains faithful even to his death at the hands of executioners. Jesus sees potential that we cannot. Jesus sees you just as you are, but he also sees you as you are to become. If he is calling you out of where you are, if he is calling you to drop your net, it's because God sees more in you than you do. He knows what you've done. He knows your past. He knows all of that. But he also absolutely knows what your future holds. He knows what you can be and what you can become. Which is why he calls you out of a temporary, earthly-focused existence. He calls you into the eternal realm where the things you do have more value than just a paycheck or just checking off a box. He sees potential in you that you can't see. And he has the ability to unlock that potential where you do not. It's, this isn't just a, a moment for us to step back and go, oh, wow, maybe I am capable of more. I'm going to work hard. I'm going to try to develop all my skills. I'm going to look for more opportunities. No, 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 no. You don't have the ability to unlock the potential. Jesus does. He says, follow me and I will make you into. I sent a text out the other day, and I said, hey, what do you think it would have sounded like if these guys hadn't been fishermen? Like, what if they were plumbers? And so I got almost the same response from everybody that I sent it to, and I won't share it with you. Fill in that blank, though. Like, what does it look like if they're builders or bakers or nurses or doctors or accountants how does, that, how does that sentence end? Hey, drop your spreadsheets and I will make you following Jesus requires you to drop your nets, your spreadsheets, your monkey wrench, whatever it may be because he sees potential in you that's beyond that. And there is a guarantee that in following Jesus, if we do it wholeheartedly, 
there will come a day where the people who knew you will be amazed because they didn't see that in you. They didn't see that ability. They didn't see that opportunity. They didn't see that level of faithfulness, that level of commitment. They, they never saw you as a, a person who was really passionate about things. That, they didn't see that in you. Only Jesus has the power to unlock that. And so it's not random that as he just happens to be walking along the shoreline, he goes, oh, I think I've met that guy. Peter, Andrew, follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. James, Don, John, drop, drop your nets. Come follow me. He had purpose in it, and there is purpose in it. Jesus sees potential that you can't see, and he is able to unlock potential that you can't unlock. And then I got three questions for you. Um, and I, I've kind of adapted these from some from Chuck Swindoll. Jesus found these guys in boats, doing their jobs, normal lives. Where does Jesus find you today? Ask yourself this question. Understand that Jesus knows your past and he sees your present. He, he knows your family situation. He knows your work situation. He knows your financial situation. He, he knows all of that. He knows your abilities and he knows your liabilities. And he is always calling you out and up and onward. Where does Jesus find you today? If you're honest with yourself, Jesus met the disciples right where they were. He knew that Simon, who he would call Peter, had a temper. He knew he was impatient and impetuous. He knew that there would come a day where the men would come for Jesus and he would draw a sword and cut a man's ear off. He knew that. Where does Jesus find you today? He knew they would be on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. That was their physical location, but he also knew where their hearts were. He knew that these were men who were open and eager to be called. How do I know that? Because they didn't wrestle with the decision. They didn't say, can I get back to you tomorrow? They didn't say, can, I, can, I, can we talk to our dad first? Hey, dad, is it okay if we leave you and the hired men to, to tend to the nets? They didn't, they didn't have to run this by anybody. These were men who were open and eager. Is that where God finds you today? Does he find you ready and desiring whatever it is he has for you? For those of you who have repented and believed, does he find your heart open and receptive to the call he may place on your life? Maybe it's to literally drop your occupation, or maybe it's a call to something that transcends it. And that's the second question. What is the calling of Jesus on your life? Because the calling of Jesus on your life might not involve a geographical move or a change of occupation, but it always requires a change of focus and a change of purpose. In this story, he calls four fishermen, and when he calls them, they seem to lose all interest in fishing. Now, for some of you who love to fish, you can't imagine that scenario where God would call you and you lose all interest in fishing, okay? But there's nothing you've got to know. Like, don't, don't think of Peter and Andrew as, as poor, ragged fishermen. Like, you do realize how big the fishing industry was on the Sea of Galilee, which was basically a really big lake. Like, they were, the fish from this sea was prized and was shipped across the known world. There were no less than 20 fishing ports dotting this sea. This was big business. And if you've got men fishing with hired help, this was, this was a large operation. They left behind not only occupations and nets, they left behind, they left a whole lot of money on the table. What's the calling on your life? 
Because for these men, it meant leaving that behind and following Jesus to minister professionally, I guess, for the rest of their days. But for more people than that, more, most people who choose to follow Jesus, they don't change jobs. They don't move to another state or to another city or to another part of the world. Instead, they find new purpose in their vocations, in their relationships, in their very existence. Follow me and I will make you fishers and, and plumbers and electricians and pharmacists and CEOs and teachers of men. Do we not realize that God can use us to reach the world from right where he has us? If we follow him, when we respond to the call of Jesus, we find that purpose that it may not change our occupation, but it absolutely transcends it. Some of you have already woken up to this. God has already given you a picture of this. You've already responded to that call, and it hasn't caused you to change jobs, but it has completely changed the way you see your job. As an employee, as a boss, as a mother, a father. And here's the last question. How quickly will you respond? Do you need every question to be answered? Do you need to know how everything's going to work out? Do you need all the risks removed? Can I just tell you, your hesitation is costing you. Because here's the truth. There are no risks in following Jesus. Only rewards. There's no, would you guys agree that it's not a risk if the outcome is guaranteed? I mean, the very nature of a risk is that you don't know how it's going to end, how it's going to, but we absolutely already know that. Now, we don't know what, uh, you know, B, C, D, E, uh, between A and Z are going to look like. I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I know who holds all of this. I've already read the end of the story. I know that Jesus overcomes. I know that I can't be defeated by anything, even death itself. I can absolutely face any scenario and go, what's the worst that could happen here? I die, it doesn't matter. Jesus has already overcome death. I'll be raised again. Like, we can't be stopped. There's no risk. For these first four men, they were stepping into a risky proposition. They had believed in him. They had already seen him. They had heard it. They believed it with all their heart. And then they spent the next three years grappling with it. You guys have read their story. I mean, honestly, it's like a comedy. They would see Jesus perform a miracle, and then they would immediately get on the road, and they would start arguing about who was his number two. Completely missing the point. There's no risk in following Jesus, only reward. And there's no risk in not following him, because that's guaranteed as well. And here's the reality. Hesitating. Not responding is a response. Saying, I'm not ready to choose to follow Jesus with my life is a decision in the opposite. How long will it take you to respond? Now, it may be that there is someone in the room or someone who um, hears this on a recording or watches it on a video and the call on your life is to repent and believe. Because that's where it begins for all of us. It's a call to repent of our sin and believe in Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. It has come near. He came and died to save you. And that may very well be the call that you're hesitating to respond to. You're trying to do it your own way. You're trying to be good enough on your own. All those things. And that's the call that you're beginning with. There is a default position. And it's choosing your own way. And that outcome is guaranteed. That may even make a lot of sense in your mind. Some of these things of following Christ, it may not, it may not make perfect sense. You're like, I don't know. Why would he do that? Why would he die for me? How did he raise from the dead? I've read through, I've read through some of the Old Testament stuff. How do I connect all of those dots? 
How did, how, how did creation, how did all those things work? Understand this. Jesus came proclaiming good news, and the good news was this. The kingdom of heaven is here. Repent of your sin and believe in me. And his word says that there's a way that seems right in your mind, but the end of it is death. So the call for you may be to repent and believe. But for those of you who have, understand this. There's a call that goes right along with that. A call to follow me and I will make you. I don't know what God wants to make out of you. But I know it's more than you can be on your own. I know it's more than just the label that your occupation may give you. And it may be a fantastic occupation that you've worked very hard to achieve. But understand this. God's purposes want to transcend that. God may very well want to use that, that occupation, that gifting, that skill, that ability, but understand this, it only works if you follow him with it. And the the call to you today may be to figuratively drop your nets. Say, God, whatever your purpose, whatever your plan is, whatever that is, I'm gonna follow you. Maybe it's time you stopped hesitating. And so I'll stop hesitating in wrapping this up. Let's respond. Father, you have come for us in sending Jesus for us. The message is clear and the message is simple. The kingdom of heaven has come near. God, you broke through And Jesus took on flesh and became one of us and lived among us and died for us, was buried and rose again victorious over death and hell and anything sin could throw at him or us. And today, Father, it may very well be that the call on someone's heart and life is to repent of their sin, repent of the sin of trying to be good enough on their own and to believe in Jesus. And if so, God, today I pray that they would just speak to you in prayer, admitting their sinfulness and their need of Jesus and receiving that forgiveness. But God, I know our tendency, and I don't know that we're any worse at it than people have ever been. Maybe it's because we're so well connected. Maybe it's because we have instant access to anything that, honestly, our heart desires. Father, we don't, have to, we don't have to try to think about anything. We don't have to guess about anything because we can look it up. We can know instantly. Father, we, we, we set plans and we forecast the weather and we forecast the stock market and we, we want to plan everything out. We want to know everything between here and there. And Father, you just simply called, follow me and I will make you. And today I pray that we will respond that we will trust you with the making and we will devote ourselves to the following. Father, work in us. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.